I think it's that way. Yeah? Yes. It's private, it's private on it. Yeah, but we should get in because we've got our passes. Okay. I've worked in Westminster for the best part of a decade. And so has my producer, Aggie. That's who you can hear there. And still, we get lost here sometimes. I actually think we went through the wrong door. I got my first job as a parliamentary journalist back in my mid-twenties. That's when I first met Aggie, also in her first job. Back up the stairs. We both know what it's like when you first start working in Parliament, feeling in awe of the place, intimidated by the building, but also the people in it, MPs. To a young person starting out in politics, are like celebrities. It's a privilege, but there's another side to it. The bad behaviour, the gossip, the rumours. It's not called the Westminster Village for nothing. Like any village, and I should know, I grew up in one. Everyone knows everyone else's business. Over the years, I've heard stories of sexual harassment and bullying. They mostly stay hidden because powerful people tend to be protected by the system and by each other. But now we're going to tell some of those stories. I was told that the guy who hired him said, oh, he's a good looking man, he wouldn't do that. He has women throwing themselves at him. They're relying on you, not fighting the machine in a way. People treat it as a joke, a juicy bit of gossip. My biggest fear is if I don't speak out, he's going to be around forevermore. It's been five years since I worked with her, and if I smell the same perfume that she wore, it still makes me feel nervous. You know, basically, if it's not full on rape, it's OK. I'm Liz Bates, and from Sky News, this is The Open Secret. Part one, the sex pest. There was one story this summer that changed the course of British politics. And at the very heart of it was an accusation of sexual assault. You said that you had uh, drunk far too much uh, that night, Mr Pincher. What exactly happened in the Carlton Club? About three years ago, uh, there was a complaint made against uh, Chris Pincher in the Foreign Office. Uh, It was raised with me. Are the Tories collapsing? Are you doing anything to deal with your party's toxic culture, Prime Minister? And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. Chris Pincher, a senior Conservative in charge of party discipline, was accused of groping two men in a private members club in central London. But it wasn't what Mr Pincher actually did that brought about the end of Boris Johnson's premiership. It was the question of what was already known about him. By who? And why did they decide to promote him anyway? And that's what we're trying to get at in this podcast. Was his behaviour an open secret? And how many other secrets from all of the political parties are being kept in the corridors of power? Throughout this series, Aggie and I are going to take you into the heart of Westminster, behind the grand exterior, through Parliament's corridors and into the offices and bars the bits that you don't see. So we've walked just two minutes from uh, the House of Commons chamber and now we are in a bar, Strangers Bar. It's the most famous uh, bar in Parliament on the terrace next to the Thames. And I think that's quite central to this story, not the drinking uh, necessarily, but the kind of blurred lines here sometimes between work and socialising. Professional and personal lives can become very intertwined. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's also the way that when people work here, it's very different from a normal job. It's not nine to five. You're working for a political cause you really care about. So you're working with a lot of people who you have similar views to. You're often expected to be available whenever you're needed. That's evenings, weekends even. And you can never really switch off. And for a lot of people, their life outside Westminster takes a back seat. Yeah, and it can be, look, a great experience and it is for loads of people. But it does mean sometimes that 
kind of normal professional boundaries sometimes go out of the window a bit. So your colleagues become your friends and your drinking buddies and you message them more than you message your own family and friends sometimes. And often it's quite powerful senior people mixing with sometimes people much younger than them who look up to them. And that can sometimes be where things go a bit wrong. Yeah, and there's definitely an attitude among some, definitely not all, but some people in power, that they can and do do what they want. And it's been like this for years and things come out in the newspapers, there have been investigations, reports, there have been real efforts to improve things and I think things have improved a lot, but based on what we'll hear, just not enough has changed. Let's try and find out why. Okay, I want to pause here for a minute because some of the stories you're going to hear are pretty tough. Personal accounts of bullying and sexual misconduct. So if that's not for you, that's fine. But if you want to keep listening, we're going to find out what exactly is going on in Westminster and try to figure out why, despite seemingly lots of people knowing that this stuff is going on, not enough progress is being made. The first story we're going to hear actually takes us off the parliamentary estate. So we are uh, in central London on our way to meet a young woman who did work in Westminster for a while for an MP. She's going to tell us about something uh, that happened to her. Is that right, Ags? Yeah, that's right. So we've met her a few times, but always away from Parliament. So right now we're walking down Embankment and we're just going to meet her in a beer garden in central London. We call her Emily. But that isn't her real name, and it's not actually her voice you'll hear either. She didn't want anyone to know who she is, because she's scared of what the consequences would be of talking openly. But this is her story, in her own words. And the man that she's talking about is not only an MP, but at the time of recording is also at the top of government part of the Prime Minister's Cabinet. I was sexually assaulted by someone who's now a Cabinet Minister. And I was in my early 20s and didn't really know how to deal with it. I was super drunk. He's feeding me more wine and I'm already quite obviously tanked. And I didn't know how, like, what the time lapse was. But after a while, I was like, you know what? Would you mind if I just went to bed? So I went to bed, but obviously he didn't leave me alone. And then um, I woke up the next morning and I um, I realised what had happened. I was clearly quite uncomfortable. And this is corroborated by the fact that like, I was so shocked by it, what had happened... I told my housemate as soon as I got home and my housemate told me that if it were him, he wouldn't tell anyone what had happened. And so I just went home and went to bed for the rest of the day. I called a couple of friends a few days later, but didn't pursue anything about it immediately and was just like, holy shit, this happened. I reported it to an MP I worked for a couple of years later And I did go to the police years later as well and had a very brief chat with them and decided not to proceed with a formal complaint because they couldn't give me any reassurances until I made a formal statement. I was too scared to kickstart that process and risk it spiralling out of control. I've seen texts from that night and from the weeks and months after. And I've spoken to the MP Emily told. He told me... He encouraged her to go to the police. It's been really difficult because he has continued to be promoted and I'm very clear that he shouldn't be there. But there's nothing that I can do without putting my career in jeopardy and kind of ruining my life and being re-victimised all over again. I think he has continued to think it's fine and always makes a point of being nice to me in front of other people. I mean... I was having lunch in Parliament with a friend of mine and I hadn't seen him in years and I genuinely didn't see him. 
he came over and was like, hey, how are you? It's so good to see you're doing so well. And I was just like thinking, mate, what are you doing? He just has zero shame. Another time, I went to an event in Parliament, and when I turned up, he turned up and kissed me on the mouth. So instead of going for the cheek like a normal person, he went straight in. And my friend saw it and was like, holy shit. And he was like, sorry, accidental. And I was like, it wasn't though, was it? Emily no longer works in Parliament, but what happened to her still impacts her life. It's like, step one, get sexually assaulted. But your nightmare does not end there. You get bullied and intimidated by this person who just likes to periodically remind you that they're still important for years afterwards. I managed to, like, get through my life for several years without giving it a moment's thought. And um, I think, actually, the only times that I've been kind of um, happy in the past couple of weeks, I've been sort of not thinking about it and just forgetting that it exists. And every time I have to seriously entertain coming forward, it's like it sort of takes me back to a weird place. It's actually better today than it was like sort of five, six weeks ago because I've actually kind of um, almost desensitised myself to it again. My feelings on it change day to day. I'm sitting there wondering, is today the day that I decide to just like set everything on fire and go forward? And then I'm like, no. My biggest fear is if I don't speak out, um, he's going to be around forevermore. Okay, so we just left the pub. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think the bit that was really so shocking for me about that was, you know, first of all, she was so young when it happened. Um, She did tell people, but nothing was done. And it clearly is still having an effect on her life. And she doesn't want to speak publicly because she's worried that if she does, then this will continue to affect her life and her future. It could ruin her reputation. It could ruin her career. Yeah, and also, you know, on on the flip side, he has just continued to be promoted and promoted and he is currently in Cabinet and she is sort of worrying about it every day. The consequences of this are all on her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A government spokesperson said, we take allegations of sexual misconduct extremely seriously and there are robust procedures in place to raise concerns. All ministerial appointments also follow established processes. Of course, it's worth noting here that ultimately it's the Prime Minister. At the moment, that's Boris Johnson, who chooses his cabinet, and the civil service just can't interfere with that process. You might be thinking, if people knew about this... Why was it not dealt with formally at the time? But as I've said, Parliament is not a normal workplace. And this is where I'm going to break it down for you. Now, there has been a scheme set up to support people who work in Parliament with things like this. But some people still don't trust it. And we'll come back to that. Putting that aside... The options are not great if something like this happens. And that's because, first of all, there's no real formal HR. So you can forget that. If you wanted to complain about an MP, for example, the person you might go to first is the office manager. But they are employed by the MP. So their career is very much in the MP's hands and they're usually pretty close to them as well. In some cases, they're married to them. So that's not always a great option. You could also go to the party's headquarters or to the whips. They're the MPs in charge of party discipline, getting their colleagues to do as they're told, basically. But you'd have to bear in mind that really 
their priority is to protect the MPs and the party's reputation. On top of all of this, there's a fear that if you're seen as a troublemaker, then people above you will speak to each other and basically you'll never get another job in Westminster. And that's not just a baseless fear. I know people that it has happened to. And that's why accusations like Emily's don't always get dealt with properly. So when we talk about Westminster, we don't just mean Parliament. There's also Whitehall, and we're walking down there now, where there's all the government departments, the civil servants, and of course Downing Street itself. And that's where we're going. We just need to get through these big gates at the front. How are you? Yeah. Too bad. Thank you. Cheers. So now we're standing, if you can imagine, opposite at number 10, the big famous black door. Now, this is usually where all the journalists and the photographers gather on those big news days. And we've been here a lot over the past few months, haven't we, Ags? Yeah, we have. Um, I mean, journalists spent hours here covering the final days of Boris Johnson's premiership and, of course, Partygate, which actually, I think in many ways, is a story about how professional and personal boundaries can be blurred in politics. So people were here working all hours and sometimes that did turn into drinking and socialising late into the night. Yeah, and the reason that we're here is that we've also spoken to someone who used to work here. Polly is what we're going to call her. That's not her real name. Her story concerns someone who still works here, who is a man in a senior role at number 10. But yeah, so she's different to a lot of the people we've spoken to, right? Because when this thing happened to her, she was actually quite senior herself. Yeah, and the power balance was actually the other way around. So she was really confident that she knew how to deal with it. She's been around for years. She understands the processes. But in the end, that actually didn't make it any easier to get something done, as she quickly found out. I was working a conservative event at an evening reception. I was with a number of colleagues in this room. It was pretty, like, crowded, sweaty, full of men. And basically, I felt someone grab my ass. And I turned around and this guy was just like looking right at me. And I was like, you just touched me. And he was like, no, I didn't. And I was like, yes, you did. I just felt you do it. And you're looking right at me. Like, basically, I kicked off and I told him to leave me the fuck alone. Like, basically got mouthy. I decided to formally complain, partly because I was like, OK, this is not the most egregious or traumatising, but like, how is it that these people just feel they can behave however they want and just be protected by an industry that seems to not particularly care? I complained to CCHQ. I outlined what I thought should happen next, which basically was he shouldn't be working for political campaigns if he was behaving like that. He should take responsibility and this should be logged in case it happens again. So for any other women that come across this guy, there should be a record. When she says CCHQ, by the way, she's talking about Conservative Campaign Headquarters. As a result of Polly's complaint, the man was taken off the election campaign he was linked to at the time. Step forward to the present day, I heard that he was going to get a job in Downing Street. I raised it with a number of people. Again, I wasn't like saying, you should not do this. I was saying, do you think this is what you should do? Are you grown-ups capable of taking a stand? What kind of message does this send? Nothing happened. So I then formally complained to the Cabinet Office. I just felt the responsibility to do it again, partly because the office he's going to be working in is full of women, and I just thought he'd do it again. After Polly launched a formal complaint, the story got a bit of media attention. I was told that the guy who hired him said, oh, he's a good-looking man, he wouldn't do that, he has women throwing themselves at him. He said that to a few people and then basically went mad trying to kill the story and defend him. I know that all parties have got their really bad examples of this, but the Conservative Party have a very special ability to try and protect and uphold power. The man who Polly says groped her is still working in Number 10. I think my mind was really opened about how far people will go to keep things quiet and basically just brush everything under the carpet. You've seen how these stories have been around for a very long time about people and yet nothing happens. And as long as you've still got somebody at the top with ultimate power saying, I will not do anything about this, it's just actually a waste of everyone's time trying to find another way to fire them because they won't get fired. 
A government spokesperson told us all prospective government employees are subject to necessary checks and vetting. They added, we do not comment on individuals. And a Conservative spokesperson told us, we have an established code of conduct and complaints procedure where people can report complaints in confidence. They said, we take any complaint seriously. So one of the things that I found quite shocking about that story was separately from what happened was what Polly said about his boss's reaction when he heard about the allegations to say he's too good looking to have done something like that. It just shows if he did say that a real level of ignorance on this subject because anyone can behave like this. Yeah, it sort of feels like something you'd hear in the 1960s, doesn't it? But I think the other thing that this story really highlights, and we haven't really touched on this yet, is the, the, the real low-level stuff um, that goes on. It isn't necessarily clear-cut, but it makes people feel uncomfortable, like people kind of feeling entitled to put their hands on someone. So one example that comes to mind for me is I was speaking to a young female journalist who was trying to get an interview with an MP in Parliament. And during their conversation, he just came really close to her and while they were talking, just put his hand on her hip. And she was like, I couldn't, I couldn't, as I said, couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it just made me feel really uncomfortable. Yeah, and that's actually um, happened to me as well. When I was much younger as a journalist, I was at Conservative Party conference, and I was like standing in a group of journalists, and an MP came up to the group and stood close to me and put his hand at the bottom of my back and just stood there with it there. And I was like, ooh, this is quite creepy, but I just... Didn't want to make things awkward, so I just didn't say anything. Of course, none of this is new. People have been talking about this problem for years. And that's why, in 2017, when the Me Too movement was at its height and stories were coming out left, right and centre about bad behaviour in Parliament, Andrea Leadsom, the then leader of the House and a senior Conservative MP, stood up in the Commons and said this. The House must address the urgent issue of alleged mistreatment of staff by members of Parliament. These allegations make clear that there is a vital need to provide better support and protection for the thousands of staff members working in Westminster and in constituency offices across the country. There can be no place for harassment, abuse or misconduct in politics. Your age, gender or job title should have no bearing on the way you are treated in a modern workplace. Andrea Leadsom and a group of MPs from all parties looked into why so many of these accusations were coming out of Westminster at the time. She agreed to speak to me about it from her constituency during the summer recess. It was absolutely clear to me that People need to have a clear set of responsibilities. They need to understand the extent of their authority as well as the extent of their responsibility. And in all of these employment relationships, it just seemed to me that people were batting around in the dark. And then, of course, added to which, because people work such long hours in Parliament, so you have restaurants and the restaurants serve alcohol and there are a few bars, it kind of had that sense of it was a bit of another university environment. You know, you go to the bar after work and then you get drunk and then you maybe hang out all evening after the house has risen and so on. So it was very clear to me that a lot needed to be done. I suppose being perhaps a bit older, it just seemed to me crazy that we hadn't cracked this. So at this point in 2017, IPSA, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, had existed for quite a few years, right, since the expenses scandal. So why wasn't that body ensuring proper work practices were being observed? What IPSA was designed to do was to address one problem only, and that was the issue of MPs' expenses. Whereas for my money, what it should have done was to professionalise the whole employment relationship. And the biggest missing piece, which I tried very hard to get included then, is that IPSA don't provide any kind of HR. And IPSA would not do that. Even when the whole scandal hit Westminster and I was saying to them, you know, you really need to step up here. No, 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 they weren't interested. So what we ended up with was the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme, which we wanted to develop for harassment, sexual harassment and bullying. So, look, this is something that 
you've always been really personally committed to. Why is that? You know, we're the role models for the country. You know, if we allow bullying and harassment and sexual harassment to go on unchecked, then we're setting a terrible role model for the rest of society. So I want us to kind of demonstrate the best. And at the moment, we're not quite there. The ICGS was launched in 2018. And between then and June 2021, nearly a thousand people have contacted its helpline. One of the most high profile cases it has dealt with is James. Again, not his real name. Can you hear me okay? Is this headset okay? Yeah, 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 I can hear you perfectly. Smash it. He was subjected to unwanted sexual advances from an MP, Patrick Grady, who was at the time with the Scottish National Party. As a result of the accusations, he's now sitting as an independent. The incident happened back in 2016, when James was still a teenager and Patrick Grady was in his late 30s. Five years later, James reported it to the ICGS. And a year after that, they upheld his complaint. Following that, he went to the Metropolitan Police. But earlier this year, they chose to take no further action. So, in the end, the punishment for Patrick Grady was a two-day suspension from Parliament. For James, the impact lasted a little longer. He says that after he made the complaint, he felt he had to leave his job because it became a non-role with no work to do and no route back to normality. So I did bury it for a while. It took a long time to process and have the courage to, to come out with it. You know, things I was worried about did happen, so, and that is a result of all of this. Um, I've lost my job, but uh, the MPs are still in their job. So let's go back to 2016 when this all started. Can you tell me exactly what happened? Yeah, um, so the issue, uh, the incident with myself and Patrick Grady um, happened when I was 18 or 19 years old. I think I may have just turned 19. And Patrick came over uh, towards me and sat on, uh, perched himself in the arm of the couch on my left hand side. Uh, while he did that, the right hand side of the couch was a free seat. So he chose to perch himself on the arm instead of sitting next to me. Um, and after that, he started to put his uh, fingers down the back of my collar uh, and the back of my neck. Uh, and at the time, you know, I was wearing a, a suit and tie. Um, so to get your fingers down the back of my neck wouldn't have been an easy thing to do given I had a tie on with a button-up shirt. It was quite tight. Um, so you had to be quite forceful to do that. Um, he was also playing with my hair uh, and making comments like, I wish I had hair while doing it, uh, which just sort of made the whole thing even more creepy, to be honest, and, and harder to handle. Um, you know, I hadn't really received much attention like this from a man before. So at the time, at 19 years old, and keep in mind, this is my dream job. Um, I always wanted to work in Westminster and I get there and it's the first year of my job. Um, and this MP who's, you know, almost twice my age is making, not only making a move on me, he's touching me without my consent. Um, and making comments about my hair and wishing that he had it too. So it was, it was just a very, very, sad situation to be part of. I look back at it now, I'm 25, and I can see how wrong it is. Um, and, you know, if I could go back, I wish I would do things differently and said something at the time. But at 19 years old, a junior member of staff, and there's an MP doing something, someone that has a lot of uh, influence over my career, it wasn't really something I wanted to define me straight off the bat. Uh, you know, this is the guy that got harassed off Patrick Grady. Don't, don't speak to him, stay away from him. That kind of, I don't want that to happen. What happened to James was witnessed by someone else in the party and it was eventually reported to the SNP's Westminster leader, Ian Blackford. He made Patrick Grady apologise but allowed him to stay in his role as James's boss. Years later, when Patrick Grady was suspended from Parliament over the incident, the SNP leader and his MPs talked about it in a private meeting which was recorded and leaked to the Daily Mail. The sound's not great on that, but that's Ian Blackford saying that everyone needs to rally around not James, the victim, but the perpetrator, Patrick Grady. The story caused uproar. A few weeks later, I bumped into Ian Blackford outside my office in Westminster. 
take our responsibilities properly. And have you apologised to the victim? Because you said I, you should rally around Patrick Grady. I've offered to meet the victim and make it sure that out of all of this, and put as this case or any other, that the interests of the victim must come the first. The victim says you haven't reached out to him at all or apologised to him. Um, I, yes, I have done. I put a statement out when I did just exactly that, and I would reiterate it again that I, I apologise for everything that the victim has gone through. Nobody should feel unsafe in Parliament, whether it's this case or any other case. Ian's handling of this made everything a lot worse and his failure to um, take responsibility for that, uh, you know, it's not just shocking, it's disappointing, but it puts every staff member for the SNP at risk working for him. But ultimately, it's me that's paying the price for this. This MP's still walking around as an MP claiming to be exonerated uh, and I'm out of a job. So yeah, it's just, it's a one-way street and it's there to, it's designed to uh, protect the members of parliament. So why do you think Westminster is like this? Why is there this culture where MPs feel like they can behave like this and just get away with it? When they go down to Westminster, they're leaving their family, they're leaving their friends and their life there, and they're going down to the big smoke, London, and in the bars of Westminster, there's no CCTV, there's sometimes a journalist or two, but you know, it's really, it's behind closed doors what happens there. Um, and even if something bad happens to you, you want to complain, it might not get found out because there is no CCTV and a lot of witnesses are colleagues they don't want to affect their um, careers too so it's like a private members club in that way it really really is so um, I also remember you telling me about a comment that was made to you uh, after another incident this time I think it was with a female MP Uh, another member of parliament who I won't name um, approached me in the strangers bar which is actually where the alleged harassment had happened um, and had said to me that, uh, you know, I understand you got some unwanted attention from an MP the other night. Um, and I said, yes. Uh, and he said, you know, you should have gone home with her uh, because she had a tight fanny. An MP said that? That was a member of parliament for the Scottish, Scottish National Party that said that to me. Wow. OK. Um, and I think you said some other people said some pretty dismissive things to you about the um, Patrick Grady incident as well, right? Someone in your office? Um, and he just turned around on his computer chair, swung around um, as I was talking to him and said to me, you know, it's not like he pinned you against the wall and raped you, is it? Which just goes to show really the attitude in Westminster towards this sort of behaviour. Like, it's, it is tolerated to an extent. There is a line of tolerance. You're allowed to maybe pat someone on the bum. You're maybe allowed to put your finger down someone's back of someone's neck. Maybe you can kiss them without consent. But as long as you don't rape them. And to me, that is it's abhorrent and horrific. But it really does show the culture inside Westminster and, and how people view this kind of thing. You know, basically, if it's not full on rape, it's OK. We reached out to the SNP about what James told us and one of their spokespeople said the SNP takes all complaints seriously and the parliamentary group fully accepted and implemented the recommendations of the ICGS. The individual concerned, they mean James here, was offered support throughout the process and we have also initiated a review of staff support to consider any improvements that could be made. A few people have talked about a whisper network, a sort of informal safeguarding system where people who've been around for a while warn others about who to stay away from. But it's not just staff and civil servants. Everyone talks about this, including MPs. Fifth floor. Um, can I see what the writing is? Charlotte Nichols is a Labour MP. Elected in 2019, she's also a young woman new to Parliament, whose status still hasn't protected her from predatory behaviour. She shares her office, right? Oh yeah, this is her door. Okay. In order to survive in Westminster, you do have to rely on that whisper network. Um, Ultimately, it's never going to be 100% effective. You know, some of the most dangerous people are probably the last people that you'd ever suspect. You know, I have been repeatedly propositioned by an MP who is old enough to be my grandfather, um, sometimes in front of other colleagues who have either laughed off or said nothing when he's done it. I know from speaking to other people that, um, you know, this is not 
uncommon behaviour for him. Um, and in some respects, you know, perhaps I feel lucky compared to some of the other people who've had worse from him. It sort of gets laughed off as, you know, that's just who he is. He's very old school. Um, you know, sort of back in the day, that was acceptable. But, you it's know, CNMP. yeah, it's 2022. Um, and, you know, I'm not convinced that colleagues 10, 20 years ago would have found the sorts of things that he says any more flattering than I do, frankly. It's something that he clearly feels emboldened to do, that he feels entitled to do. And I think the lack of action or consequence and the fact that his name is spoken about quite openly, that everyone knows what he's like um, and that, you know, he's not the only one. There have been so many attempts to sort this out over the years and yet it still feels like it's just ingrained in the culture here. Do you know why that is? So I think the people who are kind of actively perpetrating it are very much in the minority, but a lot of them are also quite brazen about it. I think you have a another larger cohort who are sort of bystanders, who often witness these things, but maybe don't say anything. And then I think you have a bigger group of people who when these sorts of things are said, they're much more interested in the damage that it does to their party or to Parliament as an institution than they are about resolving the issue. We contacted the House of Commons to ask what they made of this. And a spokesperson said to us that bullying, harassment and sexual harassment have absolutely no place in Parliament. Parliament's Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme was set up to enable anybody in the parliamentary community to report mistreatment in confidence. They told us they want to make sure everyone working in Parliament feels able to report such instances. And they said they know that at present there are still barriers to this happening and that there is still work to be done to ensure that everyone is treated with the respect and dignity they deserve. OK, so we're back where we started, Aggie, on the terrace, in the bar. We've heard all these stories here about sexual misconduct. And I think the really shocking thing for me is that some of these people are still in top jobs. And it does seem at this point like they are probably not going to face up to these allegations. The other thing is they're not isolated incidents. This is still a bit of a culture. And these are just some of the stories that we've heard. But there were a lot more. I do think we need to say here though, and everyone we spoke to wanted to stress, this is not all MPs. This is not everyone in positions of power in politics. They're not all creeps, far from it. And most of them are actually in it for really good reasons, in it for the right reasons and want to help people. But when people do bad things, the processes aren't necessarily in place to protect people. And this place has a long way to go before it becomes a modern working environment. 100%. And the other thing is, we've gone through all of these stories about kind of predatory behaviour. But the other thing, of course, is that whilst we were speaking to people about this, lots of people came to us to talk about something else entirely, and that was bullying. And I think that is something that we really need to look into. I think she spilled some makeup or something. She came in with cleaning stuff and was like, there are stains all over the carpet, you should clean those up. So I was literally on my hands and knees on the floor. Next time on The Open Secret, The Bully. It's been five years since I worked with her and if I smell the same perfume that she wore, it still makes me feel nervous. We're still working on this episode and we'll get it to you as soon as we can. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch about anything you've heard so far, I'm on Twitter and you can contact me directly. My DMs are open.